Ever since I was a child, I have like processed my own reality by writing stories. You know, people do get locked into that belief system that they can't change. Ultimately, the, the reason that you that you are stuck is because you're, you're repeating the same thoughts over and over again. Repetition of your complaints, repetition of your reasons, repetition of your blame. Hello guys and welcome to another episode of Conscious Conversations with me, Brett Moran. And today I've got an amazing guest. His name is Tom Bast. And Tom is an author who has got an incredible story that I want to share with you. But somebody that inspires me because his writing routine, his focus and his dedication to following his dreams are amazing. And the funny thing is, I literally just said to him before we went on camera, like, how did we meet? And we both completely went blank. We've forgotten how we've even met. Tom, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, mate. Thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, really excited. We've actually got your book on the table. It's called Slaver's Bane. Tom, what is this book about in a nutshell? Uh, in a nutshell, it's about two daring dreamers who take on the evil in their empire and try to overthrow it. Wow. And so it's a, a, a hero's journey, a heroine's journey at the same time. It's amazing. I, for me, writing and this hero journey absolutely fascinates me. Where did you get this idea? You just said something, it's just always been you. What, what do you mean? Like you were always thinking about storytelling or? Absolutely. You know, ever since I was a child, I have like processed my own reality by writing stories. And so even when I was like a little boy, I would write one page stories, you know, often about mice, you know, or about, about mice. yeah, like Brilliant. little little civilizations of mice living in, in little corners and what have you. But I've just been doing it my whole life. And so when people ask me, how do you come up with these ideas? It's sort of like, that's the way I think about reality is, yeah. is to just change it into a story and then try to explain what's happening in my life, what's happening in other people's lives in this fictional world. And it comes clear to me in that fictional world and it helps me understand what's actually happening in the real world. That's amazing, man. And the mice's world. <laughs> <laughs> well, the mice are no longer part of it. Uh, Slaver's Bane has got full of uh, orcs and goblins and giants and, and all kinds of different uh, monsters. So yeah. it's most of the population. And do you, when you was just talking now, I'm, I'm guessing you have like there's stories for people, like you're relating to people in everyday life in some way, because like you're talking about a hero and people that are trying to take over this evil world, it kind of like it can relate to reality and humanity in a way as well. Maybe not the orcs bit, but <laughs> is that what you're doing? You're spreading a message inside it as well, like a, a seed or a deeper message. Yeah, absolutely. I, I try to. Um, the, whole, the whole idea is to give people a context that doesn't directly map to our real world so that they can have experiences of consciousness and experiences with these characters that are really intimate and yet don't have any of the judgment coming from the world. There's no like meta-analysis about what's going on in the lands of Daru. You've never been to the lands of Daru before, so this is all brand new to you. However, what the characters are going through and the internal conflicts that they face and the struggles that they have when they try to be daring dreamers you might be able to relate to those. And perhaps there's some wisdom in there or some, or some storyline in there that you might find inter interesting in your own journey. And so yeah. definitely I have that in, in my mind when I write these stories. It's amazing. There's a pretty famous book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I dip in and out of it because it's a, it's a, for me it's a bit of a, it's a big book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's all about the, the, the tales and the different characters. And when you, when you read that and you start watching movies, you see things in a different way, right? You, Absolutely. You relate to them. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he's like the ur text for, you know, for storytelling in a lot of ways. And he... What he did, and I've read everything he's ever written. I, I, I went through like a Joseph Campbell phase where I literally read everything he ever wrote. Nice. And I just found it absolutely fascinating. He had managed to consume an enormous amount of primary material and like synthesize it and to find similarities among stories from all these different cultures and found storylines that are universal throughout all of, all of humanity. And came up with this idea, the hero with a thousand faces, being like, well, here's, here's the basic story. Here's like the hero's journey, which is sort of what everybody goes through in life. And this is, this is a, a structure around which stories all over the world have been built. And so then, of course, where things get really interesting is in the details of how that's different. Yeah. So, so the structure is kind of the same, same for, for many different books, mm -hmm. but it's the characters and the towers and Daru and the land that mm -hmm. you kind of like, you, you tell that story in, I guess. Yes. Also, there's been something 
The hero's journey ends with the hero emerging victorious and alone. It's a very kind of masculine ideal okay. of like saying, all right, the hero triumphs over evil and he's standing you know, alone on the mountaintop holding his sword. Um, there's a different storyline, which is really much more along the lines of what I do with the Rebels of Daru, called the heroine's journey. And in the heroine's journey, the hero creates community. The hero's success is, is his ability to create a stable world. And so rather than him being alone at the mountaintop, he is a leader among men, or he is a leader among people, so to speak. And so, or an inspiration to them, mm. or some kind of a guide to them. And so this heroine's journey is to me like a lot more relevant to what I'd like to, like if I were to think about the impact that my art would have on the world, yeah. which I think is important for an artist to think about that, I would want it to have the heroine's journey impact on the world. It's like, yeah. yes, with the, the heroes end up being courageous and they're brave and the journey is awesome and the adventure is everything you ever want from a you know, good adventure story, good fantasy. But at the same time, the ultimate boon, the ultimate goal is this sense of community. Like bringing people together to rise up and yeah, to yeah. a new world, I guess. And better one another. You know, that's yeah. an important part of it. And there's a, another great book. I can't remember the author. I've actually listened to it as an audio. It's called The Hero's Two Faces or The mm. Hero of Two Faces or something. Mm -hmm. and basically, the premise of the book is about the outer journey where the hero goes on a journey, but also the inner journey, inner transformation. And I don't know about you, but I was actually reading that book and it was like therapy for me. Because <laughs> <Yeah, yeah. laughs> I could see like the stages that I've been through in my journey. Um, and then I could see like, wow, at that time when I was reading it, I was in doubt. I didn't know what was next. It was before the podcast, before stuff that we was doing. And it was kind of, they call it the dark night of the yeah, yeah. shadow or something. Dark like, night of the soul. Dark yes, night of the yeah, soul. Right. And it was like, I was like, this is exactly where I am. So I was trying to learn about writing and being a better writer. But if I'm honest, I was actually like, taking a good look at my life. And that's a point I'd like to bring up. I feel like we're all heroes on some journey in a way. Um, and when I hear you talk, like you're literally the hero of your story, right? Because <laughs> I'm sure you've had some doubt with your books or there's been some challenges. It's not always been and easy to sit down and Tom just told us yesterday you finished your fourth that's right I just finished the series yesterday yeah so has it been a bit of a journey for you writing and going and doing this yeah and, and the, the other thing that you mentioned that that was really relevant is that like the whole process of writing this has also been like a huge process of self-discovery and of like you know becoming uh, as a human being at the same time that I go through this fiction now I've been writing novels my whole life okay so this is like another novel in a long series of novels that I've written. And because of whatever reason, I'm just now starting to publish and now starting to try to find my audience. And so that, tra that, that, that is an enormous personal transformation to me to like, to like finally, after all these decades of writing novels to say, okay, now I'm ready to share my work. Sounds silly. But that's, that's my reality. How you know? does it feel now you're going to share it with the world? Oh, I love it. It's amazing. I got an email just yesterday from a random reader, a subscriber to my newsletter. Um, and I had asked, asked my readers a question in this newsletter. And, and this one person responded and just you know, complimented my, my work and how much they enjoyed it and how much they were looking forward to reading the fourth novel. You know? And I look at my KNEP, my page reads on an almost daily basis. And it's just wonderful to see people that are in there that are enjoying it. You know. And so for me, it's just been incredibly gratifying to have this switch over finally take place. Amazing. You know? mm. is, is there a reason why you didn't do it any sooner? I mean, everything's perfect timing, but was it was you holding off or you just was timing? Yeah, so, well, you know, there's lots of reasons, I guess, let's, let's put it this way. Here's, here's, a, here's a more profound answer. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to your level of, of life here. Um, a more profound answer is this, is that yeah, there were lots of reasons, but, you can think about reasons and you can place blame all day long. What really matters is what caused that. What caused me to not publish all those years? That has nothing to do with the reasons. The cause is a much deeper, you know, much deeper and more real kind of part of the whole journey. And so the cause I'm still kind of deciphering. It's rather complex boring, I think, for most people to listen to. But in my experience, it's just been, I had to find the cause in order to overcome this obstacle yeah. and get to the point that I'm at now. Yeah. 
And I think the reason why I'm asking that question is because um, if everybody's on this hero's journey, it doesn't mean that you're going to be writing books. You could be painting, you could be singing, you could uh, move to another country and start a new life. I think for me, the hero's journey is overcoming maybe your conditioning or your programming or that limit mm. itself and then becoming just, I don't want to say a better version or a best version of yourself because I think you're, you're divine already, but just doing what you know you can do. And I think a lot of people listening to this will have dreams inside them. You know, um, maybe like you, they, they've always been writing or painting as children, but then we grow up and we talk ourselves out of it or other people talk ourselves out of it. And I see a lot of people denying those dreams and those gifts. And so I, I feel like everybody's on that um, journey of the hero. And so I love what you just said. Like, don't blame, there's no blame or anything, but find that deeper reason and, and then find your cause for following your dream and, and getting it out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, people do get locked into that belief system that they can't change, that, that the situation that they're in is, is permanent, there is no escape, and there's all these reasons, again, why, mm. you know? And that, that can be true, obviously, but ultimately, it's not true. Ultimately, the, the reason that you, that you are stuck is because you're, you're, you're repeating the same thoughts over and over again in your mind. You are just doing a rep repetition of your complaints, a re repetition of your reasons, repetition of your blame, and it traps you and it degrades you. It's, it's a misuse of your intellect. And I have personally spent literally decades of my life just running these loops through my head for no reason. And so you have to get a toehold on that. You have to like make that stop, that, that, that you have to like realize that that's actually the problem. Mm. The reasons are not the problem. The blame is not the problem. The problem is the repetitive thought that you're constantly trapped in this negative loop of reciting your woes. And so, you know, the way out, as you know, it begins with meditation, begins with self-discipline, begins with, you know, taking care of yourself, respecting yourself. And these are extremely difficult journeys for somebody that has, you know, come from a traumatic background or for somebody that has just the karma or the, the constitution that requires an enormous amount of work psychically in order to advance, you have to do it. If you're not doing it, you're just decaying. Mm, you're stuck and stagnant, right? Yeah. I think I always say this, you know, I think depression, I know there's obviously some chemical imbalance for a population of, of people, a small population of people. But I think nowadays it's a, it's a bit of a buzzword to, to say that you're depressed. And, and so um, I feel like the really it's the spirit is suppressed. Yeah. If you're not following your dream, whatever that is for you, you're not, even it could be just going out in nature and meditating, whatever the, the, that gives you the goosebumps or just makes you feel good. If you're not following that, you're, you're dampening that light, that spirit that's in you. And then to me, that's just so obvious that, well, you're going to feel unhappy. Mm -hmm. You're going to start feeling depressed and it will get worse. It, it doesn't get better that way, mm -hmm. like in my experience. But this way, it is challenging and it is a bit scary. And you've got to come out of your comfort zone. And sometimes you expose yourself to the world. And even doing these podcasts for me is fearful, you know. But it's, it's also a buzz. Mm -hmm. It's also like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming, you know, I'm, I'm growing. And um, that, for me, that way always gets better. Yeah. I don't know about you. Like, it just always gets better. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the beauty of that way of mind, you know, is it just, it just continues it's like a positive feedback loop. In the same way that negative feedback loop can just like literally take up, you know, enormous amounts of time, that positive feedback loop kind of keeps you in the flow with, with like other people, with the real world, with your real work, uh, with the things that you can actually accomplish that, that will matter. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's a beautiful thing once you get it started. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll be transparent as well. Like I get it started and I go, and all of a sudden that other one, it creeps in and that's probably a point I'd like to bring up. Sometimes when I meet Tom around in the in these coffee shops and these restaurants <laughs> that we are in this beautiful island, Copenhagen, I think it was the other day you told me you just written 20 pages or something. And I'm like, <laughs> what? And at the moment, if I'm honest, I've kind of slipped back off, I wouldn't say procrastination, but I'm not waking up writing every single day like I was maybe two weeks ago. How on earth, Tom, do you just get up? Because you seem so committed and disciplined. Like, was it always that way for you? I know like writing is your gift, your talent, but do you still have days where you've got to force yourself or you don't feel like doing it? Like, how do you write 20 pages like yeah. that? It's amazing. Yeah, it's, it ebbs and flows. For, for me, like for most of my life, I always had a job. I had two kids. I had all these responsibilities. And so I never had the luxury of writing when I was inspired. I never had the luxury of writing when I felt like it. Usually I had to 
get my writing time by getting up very early in the morning and going to any cafe that would open at 6 a.m. and sitting there for you know maybe an hour and a half before I got to work. And so that was it. It was like, go, you know, do it now. Otherwise, you won't be able to. You won't. You won't get it. You know. Yeah. And so that struggle or that that like that that like uh, you know situation made me a really strong when it comes to like being able to actually trigger my imagination and control it and, and use it in a, in a productive way. But of course, tons of days, you know, I just sit there at uncle's looking at the lake, <laughs> you know, for hours, nothing, you know, but at the, end of, at the end of, say, you know, a 60-day period of time, it'll usually average out to a few thousand words a day. And so some, of the, some days are astronomical. Some days it just, it's all there and it just comes all the way. When I, when I don't have it, I know there's a reason why. And so what I have to do is figure out, okay, it's, it's, there's something wrong with this part of the story. The reader, the reader won't like this. The reader won't find this entertaining. I've, I've, got, to, I've got to make this better experience for them. There's something missing from this, you know, from the reader's point of view. And so I just sit until I figure it out the best I can, and then it flows again, you know? So it's not by any means like an even, every day, yeah. boom, boom, boom. It's not a drum beat at all, you know what I mean? It's more like a bird chirping. You know? <laughs> <laughs> nice bird chirping softly somewhere. <laughs> but it is inspiring, mate, that dedication and discipline. And, and, and there's another thing I want to bring out as well. It's like you said you were doing this ever since you was a kid. Yeah. I was listening to something the other day, because again, I'm still going through changes myself like everyone else. And it was basically saying, what did you love to do when you was a kid? You know, and I never played any musical instruments. I used to draw a little bit. And I was like, the one thing that I used to love doing when I was a kid was being a little shit, <laughs> if I'm honest. I would always kind of go off on adventures. So like, you know, it'd be the weekend and we'd go into these buildings that you're not supposed to be in and we'd play football in the yard, you know, or me and my mates would get the bike off and your mum would say, don't go too far. And we'd go further, you know. And I was sitting there and even though I'm a 40 year old man now, I'm like, I still love just getting the surfboard and going for a surf on my own or just driving to a coffee shop, bumping into you and mm -hmm. having a chat. I just love these random adventures. And so hence why me and Antonio have decided like we want to travel around the world and just meet cool people. And I'm like, wow, I'm still doing what I've always loved as a kid. Do you think that's important for some people to come back to? Because I know you're saying that you're always writing and you're still doing it now. Mm -hmm. And now you're creating a career out of it and impacting thousands of people, which is beautiful. Do you feel like that's uh, something that people may, if they're listening, like start to pay attention to like, what did you love to do? What are you good at? Or what do you enjoy? You're passionate. Guys, I know you're enjoying the video, but I've got a quick question for you. Are you okay with that monkey mind being a monkey? We've all got this voice inside the head, all voices, filled with self-doubt, criticism, judgment. But most people don't understand how important it is to master that monkey mind. So look, if you've got a monkey mind or a voice that is just busy inside your head and it never seems to shut up, I know exactly how you feel. And thankfully, I found meditation about 20 years ago. And so I have an amazing opportunity for you. It's the Bodhi Meditation Teacher Training Program. This 10 week program is designed to share with you eight Bodhi meditations. And the amazing thing about these meditations is that they are scientifically proven to help you reduce stress, reduce anxiety, uplift your mood, boost your energy. In other words, create that kind of lifestyle, that energy and that health and that happiness that most people crave. Over the course of 10 weeks, I'm gonna be your meditation coach. And at the end of this course, you're gonna become a certified Bodhi meditation teacher. That means that you can coach people one-to-one, -one, you can work from anywhere in the world, build online courses, or even teach meditation at yoga retreats or anywhere you decide. So click that link below and together, will open up your heart so that you wake up feeling positive and literally this buzz for life. The link is below. Now you can get back to your video. Have an amazing day. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. One of the things that I've learned in talking to people in my travels is that there are a number of people who don't feel as though they know what their purpose is and that their journey begins with trying to figure that out. And a great way to go about doing it might be to look at what do you love most? It's like, what, what is it that, that makes you feel happy? Because when you're feeling happy, when you're feeling like this is a great thing, even if it seems nonsensical, I enjoy folding paper. You know, I enjoy writing my surfboard in one direction until like my arms don't work anymore. Whatever it may be, it may seem useless, but if that's what gives you joy, there's something in there that you will be able to 
I hate the word monetize, but that's the word. Mm. You, you will be able to do in some way, find a way to align yourself with that and support yourself off of it. Mm. You know, and <clears throat> for me, it's always been writing. And so there's always been pretty much an obvious goal. And that's always kind of set me apart because I always sort of knew what I was aiming at. People who don't know or people who are struggling to get to it, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing to think about. Like what, what really gives you that sense of joy? Because that's when you're going to shine your light into the world. When you're in that flow, when you're feeling that way, then your light shines into the world. You're happier. Everyone around you is happier. That's the whole point. It's a positive energy, right? It's just, yeah. Even if you don't get paid for it and you don't become famous and rich and successful, and there's nothing wrong with all of that stuff if you've got your mind pretty balanced, but if you're just following what you love and you feel good, like what a great life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> like you're just feeling joyful and going around spreading that and you're just feeling good. I think when we look at the world, a lot of people just don't even feel good. Forget yeah. about the fame and the purpose and all that stuff. They generally, they're just struggling to get by, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You know, I, I feel for that. I, I, I spend a lot of time in that frame of mind, you know, and it's very much just a, this sounds so trite and you don't want to be discompassionate to people who are really trapped in a negative situation because I've been there and I know what it's like to be in it and you, that's just what's real. All these facts are holding you in it. Um, but the thing of it is that your attitude, your, your, your perception of that can change dramatically. Even a very negative situation, you know, like even being in prison, even being in debt, even being, you know, lost. You know, if you enter it, if you live in it, your whole perspective on it can start to change. And that's actually the, the first path out, is not to reject it, not to fantasize past it, not to visualize some impossible magical solution, but to just look very closely at what's actually happening. Mm. And that's not easy. Yeah, it's getting real basically. I remember the first time that that prison officer shut the door and I was in the prison cell all on my own, holding back the tears, so I was trying to be a man. I didn't want other inmates to hear me cry. But if I'm honest, I just wanted to let go. And I just remember thinking, I just remember the voice in my head was just about to like complain or blame. And I don't know where this came from, but it was just like, if you created this mess, you're the only one that's going to get out of it. And then after that, like a year later, I started reading Buddhism and but there's a quote, something like the Buddha said that you're the problem. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, well, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> but I was like, but in that, it's like, you're also the solution. Right. And, you know, if you really can, like roll your sleeves up and get a bit real, it's like, yeah, it's not grid right now. This is a mess, you know, but I somehow have created that, you know, or, or even if you don't believe you created it, but I can have the responsibility to create something different. And that, me, that for me was the best mindset I ever got when I was younger because it's helped me really create a lot of freedom in life. And I think what I'm getting from you, it's an inside job. It's a, it's a mindset, an attitude. The question is, you said you were trapped and you was going through it. And how on earth did you get to that? Did you sit down and go to a meditation one day? Or did, you know, how did it all start? What was the, the transformation or the choice point for you? Yeah. Well, I guess the, the choice point happened early on in my life where I'm just like, I don't like the way <clears throat> my mind operates. This, this, this negativity, this violence, this constant, you know, uh, police state in my head. I don't want that. Now what? Okay, how do you get rid of it? And so it took a long time for me to get even a toehold on it. There were, there were periods in my 20s where I had what I would call rage fantasies. That would be so bad I would literally black out. I would like have to hold onto a wall, you know, and I would black out for a second, then come back. Just from imagination, just from imagination gone completely amok. And what you actually are is you're addicted to the emotional experience that that fantasy creates. And so like, like literally the hormones that your, that your glands release when you have this storyline hit its crescendo, you're addicted to that. And so you do it over and over and over and over and over again. Getting, it, getting out of that is, is really difficult. When you're your own best drug dealer, you know, and all you gotta do is sit in there and think, and here it comes, that's a very hard addiction to, to arise out of. Uh, the, only, the only thing that, that helped me was meditation. And so I began it with uh, a friend of mine, we, he was uh, associated with a Tibetan Buddhist monk in Northern California. Yeah, Shagdud Rinpoche. And so I studied with him for a little while. That was a very beautiful experience. Um, and I also sat with a, uh, a Zen uh, group, Diamond Sangha in Katadi for about 10 years and just kept grinding at it. What meditation does, as you know, as the expert, I'm telling you your own, <laughs> no, own storyline. No, beginner, but, complete beginner. You know, what you learn how to do is to let 
thoughts float away. And that's, that's the first toehold on those, on those storylines that, that grip you and that addiction. The first toehold on it is to, let, is to learn how to let a thought pass without pursuing it, without cl- clamping down on that addiction. You know, just like, no, let that go. As soon as you learn how to do that and practice it, and for me, unfortunately, it took decades for me to get any kind of proficiency at this, but once you get proficient at it, even in daily life then, things that perturb you, you have a, you, you're, there, a deeper self can look at your response to this situation, to this thought, to this whatever, and let it pass away. And you just vast amounts of time fall into your lap when, when this transition begins to happen. But that's, that's the key. The, the thing is to find your way into the present moment where you can, where you can not pursue a thought. And that, that's the only way to learn that that I know of is meditation. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Two things from that. The first thing is in, in my next book, I've actually wrote about the biggest addiction is the, the addiction to yourself. Mm-hmm. And the, that false sense of self, in my experience, is what creates all the suffering. And we have to, I know we've got other addictions in this world nowadays from, you know, the phone, from drugs and alcohol, TV, shopping, gambling. But if you really want to be free, like you've got to wean yourself off of this personality or this identity that you think you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then comes that, that, that gap, that window, that, that space that you're talking about, which I love. So I'm really glad you uh, plugged <laughs> my book. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> you're very welcome. That's great. Yes. <laughs> and the second thing, I think it's just gone out of my head now. It's completely gone. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't matter. But yeah, I think that that's the first step, isn't it? Is, is, yeah. is meditation, seeing it and, and noticing that I've got the second thing. It's just come back to me. How then, that must be like a fine line for you because now you're writing fantasy books about these characters and your imagination must be phenomenal in one's world, but you've also got to be mindful, right? Because you're, you're an addict to, to, to who you think you are and this stuff. Like that must be a fine line that you, you I don't want to say snap yourself out of the imagination sometimes, but could you still kind of have a tendency to get lost in the fantasy if you're writing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, sometimes what will happen... In, you know, even in, in any internal discourse, but definitely when you're writing a story, something, a character's a situation, a character speaks, say something, it could trigger, you know, like the beginning of one of your channels in your head. It's like, oh, I remember that story. Let's go, you know, get that drug. And you find yourself like wandering off in that direction for a moment. You need to pull yourself back. That happens, of course, you know, but a lot less now. <clears throat> you know, as time goes on, like I said, I just get more proficient at it. And it's like, for me, focusing on writing, when I'm doing that, when I'm actually in the, the lands of Daru and my characters are, are having their experiences and I see it and I'm trying to give it to my reader and I'm trying to give it to them in such a way that they'll love it, that's as happy as I can be. That's, that's like exactly what I want to do with my time. You know, I've always been like that. And so it's getting to the point now where distracting me out of it is harder and harder. So I can stay really good, keep a really good focus for you know, two, three, four hours. It's amazing, man. And then when you stop writing, say you've done your 20 pages yeah. and then you stop writing and you're with your beautiful partner or you're going for a hike, you just switch off. Because I, what I find sometimes, and I because I'm still a very early sort of writer, you know, and I'm learning to be disciplined and I'm learning to notice these distractions that are trying to take me away and the productivity. But what I find sometimes after writing, so like three hours or something or four hours, I kind of, I don't want to be around everybody's conversations i'm kind of still it's like i've got to come out of that vibe does that make sense (laughs) yeah sure definitely yeah Yeah. no it's an intense way to work up your mind you know what i mean and once you've got that once you've got an internal you know an internal flow like that under your control sure it's going to take you a little while to like readapt to the to the world around you afterward but for me it never really stops it's like i've always got I, I record ideas randomly all the time. Like yeah. on a pen and paper or no, your phone? No, on, on my phone. On your phone, yeah. yeah. I, I used to actually, before these phones existed, I actually owned a digital recorder for that purpose. I yeah. carried around a little digital recorder to capture my thoughts. But they, they pop up all the time for me. Question. Why do you think some people have these amazing ideas, whether it's a book or, or something that they're going to, like an invention, something, and then they don't do something with it? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you're saying you're recording these ideas. Like now this is your life and blood and I can feel it and I see it when I meet you around. It's like amazing. But, but sometimes like God knows where these ideas actually come from, but we have this idea and we're like, wow, it's amazing. The dopamine kicks in and we're like, we're going to do it. And then a couple of days later and we forget about it or we hit that first kind of hurdle and we stopped. I'm not saying that you have the answers for everything, but yeah. why do you think some people yeah. don't follow through? You know, it's... Uh, I don't, I, I 
there's probably as many answers to that as there are people. But the, the, I, just generally speaking, though, it's like people, you know, have brilliant ideas all the time. But the amount of effort it required to overcome even the very first hurdle just seems to them like, ah, oh, you know, the chances of this ever working out, the end result, the, you know, la di da di da. It's much easier to just sit back and dream about being a famous author and, you know, you know have interviews in my head um, rather than to actually write a novel. You know, the amount of effort required is enormous to do anything in this world. And so people just shy away from it. If they found a way to live, you know, dreams go to the comfort zone to die, right? You know, if I've found a way to like pay the rent and feed myself and have a video game in front of my face for 18 hours a day, I, why do anything else, yeah. you know? People will spend years in that kind of a situation. And it's just, it's not living, you know? You, you've gotta be pushing, you've gotta be, you've gotta be driving yourself in order for you to be, in order for your blood to flow. Yeah, I, I love that you say that, because I'm really into the positive thinking, law of attraction, people call it, and, and manifesting and visualization. Um, but like, yeah, if you don't get up and take action, if you don't put effort in, and it is not easy, mm -hmm. and you have to keep on going, and you're gonna fall down a thousand times, but it's how you get up and dust yourself off to me, which, which is all the difference. And in the end, that that is actually the success. It's just the journey of becoming. Right. But you get the end result, it's great. When I published my first book, I remember we bought a thousand copies and uh, we, we had like a, a truck drop them off at my friend's warehouse. And like I went to the day they dropped all these books off and I was like, I'm gonna sell them all and it's gonna be amazing. And I remember, and I, and I spent like years writing that first book, two years I think it took me to write. And I sat down and like I opened this first box and I opened the book and it's like, it must have lasted, that sensation of like success, it must have lasted for like 10 seconds. I was like, wow. And then after that, I was like, well, oh, it, 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 this, I got to the top of the mountain and then it was just, it was over. And then I realized I had to market the book. I had to sell the book. <laughs> and then I've got another book in my head and it's just like, it's like, oh no, we've got to go through this all again. <laughs> and now I'm coming to the understanding. Actually, that is the success. It's just going on that journey. And that's lovely. I'd love to share to people what you say. Like, it's actually putting in that effort. Mm -hmm. It's that, like, because that's when you get to find your true character when he says, no, stay in bed, chill out, don't bother today. You know, mm -hmm. it's then how do you talk back to yourself? Like then you're building your like a stronger character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have to get to the point. You have to get to the point where you don't let yourself off the hook. Mm. You know, you, that that has to happen. You know, I love that. And this isn't just about writing a book. No, like, this I, is about I anything. You, this is life skills, right? Get up and meditate. Yeah. Go to the gym. Yeah. Don't eat that. Do eat this. You know, anything. You have to get to the point where you don't let yourself off the hook. I love that, yeah. Because <laughs> that monkey mind always wants to find the comfort. I think it's yeah. Rob Proctor. He says, where's the richest place in the world? See if Antonio can get it. Where's the richest place in the world? The richest, the richest place in the world. Inside you? Inside mm. you? Well, that's, that's actually a really good answer. That is a good answer. Where's the richest place in the world, would you say? Uh, where you want to be? Well, but you guys are just too spiritual. <laughs> Some people have said like Dubai. They said all of these, like I forgot that I'm talking to two evolved human beings. <laughs> but he says the richest place in the world is the graveyard because that's where all of the dreams and the inventions die with people. Mm. And I was like, wow. So you're right, it's inside you. It's, but all those answers are so correct. But it is like all of the inventions, the dreams, the books, the ideas, like so many people don't take action and they just die with those ideas. Mm -hmm. And he says, if you went in and got all those dreams and ideas, you'd be like a billionaire. And a I was just billionaire. Like, wow, that's such a great, it's just like, don't die with your music still inside you, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Before, before uh, I spoke to you on the podcast, me and Antonio were having a very deep conversation about like uh, the cells in the body mm -hmm. attracting the cells and manifesting and the cells. And then we briefly sort of spoke about it. So I'd like to kind of go a little bit deeper if that's all right. What do you think like that manifestation, like, are you creating yourself as this author? Are you, are you manifesting and intentionally creating it and then you're drawing it into your reality? through the effort and the action that you take? Or is there some kind of intelligence <laughs> that, that's doing it like within you? Like you can't get out of this basically. You, you just... Mm. Interesting. That's, that's a fascinating question. I, I would say, you know, it's very much... Um, how, how would I put it? So it's very much like something that I'm doing. And so, yes, I, I very much like set myself to this, discipline myself to make the physical things happen that have to happen and maintain a very positive attitude as best I can about anything that, that happens that's good. I try to be focused on gratitude, always have that, that attitude. I'm 
I'm a brand new author. I've written four novels, a first series. People are all like, you're just a newbie. We don't know anything about you yet. And so I'm at the very beginning of, of trying to make these things happen. And so there's a lot of negativity and failure and like rejection and what have you that comes my way as well. And I have to put that aside, you know? So there's definitely a lot of mental div discipline to like, to like handle it. But on the other hand, in my experience, there's absolutely no doubt that there's some divine aspect to everyone's life. And when you are trying to manifest your dreams, when you are trying to be in your flow, I think in some ways you align your ego with your spirit, that your spirit is here for the work. You're here, your spirit is here to, to struggle and to have all of the difficulties in your life because that's how it sharpens itself and gets what it needs from, from your existence. The ego, of course, just wants everything to be as easy and as sweet as possible. When you align the two, that's like the real goal. And I think that when you're in the flow of like whatever it is that inspires you and whatever gives you purpose, that your ego and your spirit align. And that's where this, you know, this vitality comes from. And I'm not there, I'm trying to get there, but that's the goal. Mate, what a great answer, huh? Thanks so much for watching our videos and being part of the tribe. We're really here to raise consciousness, ignite your vibration, and help you master this monkey mind. And did you know that science has proven over and over again that one of the fastest ways to reprogram your mind is through positive affirmations and things like these Bodhi beads. They're a set of 108 Marla beads that go round in a ring like this, and you practice positive affirmations to reprogram your brain. Science has also proven in a 30 day study that if you say the same affirmation and use a set of beads, then you can literally neurologically change the pathways in your brain. Now that means any of those limiting beliefs that you've got around money, around love, around health, you can change them if you repeat a certain affirmation that I am wealthy, I am loved, I am healthy. And that's why we've created a set of eight powerful meditations where you do one meditation every day with me personally for 30 days and you use your beads in your hand and each time you use the affirmation, you roll your thumb and your finger around on these beads. These meditations are videoed or you can download the MP3s, put them on your phone and literally go to bed at nighttime rolling your Bodhi beads. These Bodhi beads are handmade with love in Thailand by a local family. We ship them free to anywhere in the world and plus we donate 10% all of our profits to an elephant sanctuary here in Thailand. So click the link below, make sure you sign up right now because we're actually gonna give you a 20% discount code. All you need to do is when you go to the checkout is type in I love Bodhi and that will give you a 20% discount on your first purchase of Bodhi beads. Have an amazing day, now you can get back to the video. See you soon. I've read so many books and you know people beat the ego up or death of the ego. And I'm like, no, actually, when you realize you're not who you think you are or you're programmed to be, and you realize there's this beautiful ego, this voice that can help you, and you align it with this intelligence or like you say, spirit, like that becomes an unstoppable force. Mm -hmm. And it just feels good to be in that buzz, that, that right, vibration, right. right? See, at that point, even things like all the things that are important to you now, like money, success, fame, don't matter. When you're in that state of mind, and I've met people, I've met a number of people who have, who live that way. It's mind blowing to be in their presence. Uh, sorry, what way? The I'll fully aligned. Oh, okay, right. You know, e ego, spirit, fully aligned. Mind, spirit, <clears throat> actions, speech, everything. You know, completely aligned. I've met them. Things like money, success, all of that just means has no meaning to them whatsoever. They're like, no, that this is this is what life is about. Life is about being this way, experiencing each moment of your consciousness in this state of alignment. That's the thing. And, you know, and they're fine. They have enough to eat. They have a roof over their head. Yeah. You know? And they do seem a lot happier than most people, right? They're buzzing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and people are, are attracted to them just, just naturally. You know, I mean, they, they like attract accolades, so to speak, without even trying. You know, it's just like they have an aroma about them or something that people can find. Mm, you can feel it a mile away. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of, a lot by a Yogi Nityanda. Mm. Um, never met him or anything, but I read his book. I've got a few books here. They're huge. And uh, when I read a passage or a paragraph of it, it's, it's honestly like something's channeled and my brain just yeah. goes click. Something either moves out of my brain, a program or a limiting belief disappears, or he opens me up, my consciousness up to a, a, a new dimension or another concept of, of life. And that's it. And I'm, all I'm doing is reading. It feels like he's channeling something through this book. And yeah. 
Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. And I've never actually been in his presence, but just mm -hmm. reading his book has completely changed the thinking or who I thought I was. Absolutely. I've had reading experiences like that too. And it's remarkable. Those are, those are truly gifted writers. You know? And oftentimes, if you look at the sentence structure and you know, the paragraphing and the word count, you're like, you know, this is nothing. It's so simple and it's just obvious. And that somehow, you know what I mean? It just like removes the top of your head. And like, <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> You've hit the nail on the head, I read it. And some of the English is not even that great. And I'm just like, but my brain is just blown up. Exactly. And I'm just like, wow. You know, you know. Do you have a daily practice then, Tom? Because like, you know, I look at you, I've always felt good when I'm talking to you. Like, that's kind of my... I wouldn't say purpose, but it's like, I just follow the goosebumps. If I'm around a <laughs> group of people and I feel really great or just a one individual, I'm like, wow, I'd love to interview on the podcast, you know? So cool. Yeah, or if I'm with somebody, I'm like, oh, I'm not judging. It's just, I just feel a bit, there's a, the vibration isn't for me. I just always follow that intuition. Um, and I think that's my daily practice. I, I'll sit down and I'll connect to whatever that intelligence is for me through meditation, mm -hmm. through yoga, or just hugging a tree. Mm -hmm. So what is your, and when I'm around you, I feel that lovely energy. I really feel that vibe. And Thanks. You know, yeah, you're an inspiration to me. Again, somebody at the beginning of their, their writing journey and really trying to get disciplined. What is your discipline? Do you, do you get up and just write straight away? Do you yoga? What's the um, daily routine for Tom? Yeah. So I can take some notes. And if anyone else is listening, <laughs> take some notes. Um, yeah, so the, the morning routine is really important. You know, I get up and the first thing I do is meditate. And so that, you know, you, you, that dream state, that like semi-conscious early morning state is an important one to capture meditation. I'll do it in one of two ways. Sometimes I will chant a mandala and pray, um, which is more like a spiritual, you know, kind of, uh, the, way, the way it works in, in the, the practice that I use is, is more like you are trying to be grateful for your life, just for the experience of being alive, and just leave it at that. And that if you can express that gratitude to the divine that puts you here, that, that's a very healthy thing. The other way, other thing I will do in the morning, if I'm not doing a, like a prayer series, is I'll just do Vipassana, which is just straight up breathing meditation. And this is the meditation that everyone needs to practice, because this is the one that enables you to detach from thoughts and to recover from the addiction you have to the, mm. you know, to the triggering stories. Um, so that's the first thing I do every day. You know? And then it's like, clean up, eat, go right. So the very first thing I do every morning is, is get to work. And, and, and you, get in, you go to a coffee shop and round people and write, yeah? Oh, my whole life, I've just been a cafe writer. And so I, I, I like the noise. I like to hear conversations in the background. You know, people, people come into some of these cafes and like set up their speaker and like put on their rock and roll music, light a joint, you know? And I'm all like, good for you, man. <laughs> but I, it doesn't bother me at all. It I, I, not, not at all. I, I prefer it. And so I like having that, that background noise. And then I just like, I'll work like from 9 a.m. say until you know, three or four in the afternoon, pretty much continuously. It's amazing, man. I'm the complete opposite. I, and it's probably because I love talking to people. Mm -hmm. So I go to a coffee shop and I don't get nothing done because <laughs> I've had about 10 conversations before like 9 a.m. Right, right. So for me, like I have to be, well, this is a story I'm telling myself, but I see the results after that I'll sit down. I'm on my own for those after the meditation, which is the same as you. And I'll spend two or three hours and I'll do my best to write as much or edit. Um, yeah, I just can't be in coffee shops anymore. And I, now I go to the coffee shop without the computer because I just know I'm going to talk to people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Why well, even set it up? I'm just going to... Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it got to that point. I was like, there's no point, Brett. And then I realized I just enjoyed talking to people. Yeah. Which is, I, I needed to separate. So. Now, that's definitely your gift, man. I mean, it's like you walk in and uh, it's so much fun to watch you come into some of the restaurants around here. It's like you know everybody. <laughs> every, you like introduce yourself, say hi to every single table while you make your way over to, to say hello to us. Just to come and say hello, yeah. You know. That's why I can't write in them. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So, um, Tom, if there's anything that you would say, like to say to your readers, I mean, you're building a following, you're building an audience now. You say that you, you said that you're at the start of your journey, but you're on like the fourth novel. I'm just like, wow, you're, you're there. And I'm like, it's amazing. Because you said something lovely, like you get the comment from somebody, you read something. Is there any kind of message that you'd like to say to your audience? Uh, absolutely. You know, thank you for the opportunity to do that. I just, it's so difficult to close the loop with your readers if all they do is, is read you on Amazon. Um, I really would love to have you subscribe to my newsletter, tombast.com. You know, I'll put the uh, link in the, in the comment section below. But I want to be in touch with you. You know, I live for you. I, my, my whole point in life is to make you happy and to give you a really awesome reading experience for 20 or 30 hours. And so I would love to have you on my subscriber list. I would love to, to stay in touch with you, reply to any email I send you, and I'll get it personally, and I'll try to reply to you as soon as I can. 
um, it would be wonderful just to have you uh, a little bit closer than just as a, as a reader. Mate, I love that. It's so lovely how you're so passionate about that. You, when you're writing, do you actually think that as well? Or do you, do you have to sort of like get into the imagination and write the story? Or are you thinking, what will like Joanne with a cup of tea be thinking when she reads this? Are you actually thinking of your reader as, mm -hmm. as you're writing as well? Yeah, actually, you just like labeled the very, the, like the two steps. Step one, inside the story. Step two, the rewrite. How is the reader going through this experience? And so like usually step one, when the actual story is out, that's like, 90% done. And then when I go back and I'll, and I'll do you know, like the rewrites on it, it's all about the reader, just to make sure that it's fun for them. Yeah. Is, is there a difference for you in the imagination writing and then the kind of like the rewrite? Because for me, I really don't like editing. Like I'm like, and I'm not still saying, I know you're going to have to find a proofreader and an editor like I did last time, but there's a, there's a, a brain dump or the, the, the exciting bit, the imagination or the idea and you, and then there's like, oh, I'll, re I'll edit that like, you know, next time. And it's like, I just, I'm just editing and editing and editing and change. Sometimes I'll look at the computer and it's like, let's just say 6,000 words and I want to get it down to five and I'll spend like two hours doing it and then I, and I'll, I'll do the word count and I've, I've gone up seven to 7,000. I'm like, yep, yep. so is there a difference like in, in those processes? Do you have to put a different hat on? Yeah. No, for me, it's, a, it's just a continuation of the two. Uh, for me, I've, I've always been like a person who does like, like the novels kind of come into focus, you could say, you know what I mean? I start with the basic idea, a skeleton outline of the entire thing. And then I write, outline more and more detail, more and more detail, start writing conversations. <clears throat> and then at some point it turns into the first draft. And then to write the second draft and the third draft is just a continuation of that process. So I like go through it m several times in the process of, of refining it. That's just my, my methodology. So it's basically always rewriting, you know? Yeah. It's like that. Um, the, the, the big marble with, uh, is it Michelangelo? Yeah. That got out the, the, he chiseled out the king or whatever it was and uh, he just kept on doing it and somebody said to him like, how did you do it when all these other um, artists said that it was just a big block of marble and he said, well, I just had to get him out of it. <laughs> it's like you're just getting the book out of you and chiseling away. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed this conversation, man. I think what I, like again, we're talking about books because that's your uh, talent and gift and, mm -hmm. and your message for the world but I feel like it really is everybody's got some gift in them everybody's got something that the dream that's inside them whatever it is and I love how you are so dedicated to it and passionate about it but also you're just real with it as well it's like you gotta get up you gotta work for it you gotta discipline yourself and you've also got a practice mm -hmm. which is helping you I think that practice for whatever the artist is is listening to us is so important meditation yoga because if you haven't got that practice, you know, you, you might get lost. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have that, you've, you've got to have that practice for, for many, many reasons. And it's, a, it's one of those things where once you, once you start it, it becomes much easier. It's like the, like the starting it is what's, is what's really difficult. But once you get into the habit of it, keeping the habit going is, is a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And meditation in particular creates time. That's something that I always like to tell people who don't meditate or who are have wondering about it. Yeah. Don't have time. How could I possibly do that? I can't calm down for 20 minutes in the morning. Are you kidding? It's like I've got, I've got to get up and get moving. Um, but the thing of it is that if you, if you meditate for 20 minutes in the morning, you create like an hour and a half worth of focus later on in the day. And so you actually get more than the amount of time that you spend meditating back into your actual experience of time. You know, time that you might have lost to frenetic thoughts or whatever, you, you will begin to reclaim that. You'll have more focus when you're trying to do something directed. So meditation is, is really, really crucial for any artist out there. And not just any artist. I mean, like you said, it's, like, it's important to say, you know, whatever, your, whatever your, your brilliance is, you know what I mean? It could be a business. It could be, it could be anything, you know, anything that, anything that, that, that you're going to be doing that's going to be raising, your way of shining light. Raising your light. children or something, just yeah. being a family person. Raising your children. Being the best for you. Yeah. That's like one of the hardest ones, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> Definitely need to meditate. <laughs> no, I love that. I think meditation, I, I've got so many different tools and techniques that I can yeah. share or that yeah. I've used, but yeah. if there's one that I've always come back to and the one that's just every day is, uh, is meditation. Mm -hmm. I think if you understand the nature of the mind, not only can you produce amazing pieces of art like yourself and whatever anybody else is going to produce but you really then get to see who you're not or who you are and you can just have a better journey in life and understand this a bit more through meditation right absolutely yeah mm. yeah get that whole positive loop going so, yeah yeah 
that positive loop, that's what it's about. So guys, if you're at home listening and you're, you are stuck and you've been inspired by Tom, please make sure that you check out his books, start from novel number one, um, but subscribe to his email list. Honestly, like I hope you can feel his energy because it's lovely to be around you, especially when we catch up in the coffee shops and you inspire me to, to, to step it up as an author myself. So make sure you subscribe, reach out to Tom, start reading some of his stuff. Tom, it's been amazing having you, mate. I'm sure we'll have you again. Um, anything that you'd like to share just as we leave it at that? No, I'm wonderful. It's just been so nice being here. Thank you very much, Antonio, for all of your work. This has been wonderful. Thank he's you so been much. Sitting there meditating. I, I don't. I think, he's been, <laughs> he's, I think he's, he's been he's been magically enhancing the, the yeah. entire time. <laughs> Tom, thank you, mate. Thank Re you, mate. Really appreciate yeah, it. Take it easy. Yeah. Hello viewers, thank you so much for watching this video. I'm hoping that you enjoyed it just as much as we enjoyed making it. We love this adventure we're on, we love growing this community, and we would love you to actually help us. So I've got a favor to ask you. Make sure that you subscribe below, and if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, and turn that notification button on, because that actually helps us with the algorithm. In other words, it's gonna help us reach more people and spread this ripple effect. And I really appreciate your time and energy for watching any video. So if you've got any comments or questions or queries, make sure you pop them in the box below. By subscribing, you are going to be one of the first people to know when we release new content. If you really wanna take your journey and your growth to the next level, make sure you watch this next video and have an amazing day. Once again, thank you so much for your time and your energy. See you in the next video.